Welcome back, everyone, to Crash Course Apologetics, where I summarize the work of Christian scholars in animated videos and interviews. We've got a really, really interesting topic tonight, the topic of divine hiddenness. Why does God seem so hidden? And um, does this pose a challenge for uh, theists, for Christians in particular? Uh, how do we explain those that say they're open to uh God's existence, they want a relationship with him, but they just don't seem to uh, have that belief. How do we answer that? So if that question interests you, I think you're going to find this a very unique kind of answer to that argument. Uh, And so my guest tonight is Dr. Liz Jackson, and she uh, can tell us just a little bit about her background. She's actually been on before and, and told us some, so you don't have to repeat everything, but uh, you can tell us kind of what you're up to now. Yeah, for sure. So just wanted to start off by saying thanks so much for having me on, and I'm really looking forward to our discussion. Um, so yeah, so I'm Liz. I, uh, I guess really quick background. I did my PhD in philosophy at Notre Dame. I actually graduated last May. And now I actually work um, and live in Australia. So I'm doing research for the year at Australia National University, although I'm actually not in Australia right now, um, but I live there most of the time. Uh, and then I'll start a job next year um, at Ryerson University in Toronto. So that's a little bit about me. Um, I love philosophy, I like theology, I like philosophy of religion, and. My main focus within philosophy, I guess I should say, is um, epistemology and philosophy of religion. So that's kind of where I focus. Um, And I actually wrote this paper pretty early on in grad school. And it's kind of funny how I really did write it, but I actually had to kind of go back and remind myself, what did I argue for again? Mm. So it was kind of fun to revisit it and look at that argument again. But yeah, I was like, I need to remind myself what my arguments were. So I took a class um, on divine hiddenness, actually my very first year of grad school. And that was, uh, that was what came, this, this is part of what came out of that. So was the, am I cutting out? Everything sounds good. And and I've asked those watching and they say they can hear you. Everything looks good. No mistakes this time, hopefully. Great. Yeah. We had some technical difficulties last time, so I'm glad it it seems like it's going well. Yeah. Great. (laughs) And uh, I'll mention this really quickly. If you're watching live, continue watching. But when this video is over, you should go back and watch our previous interview because a lot of what we'll talk about tonight builds on and kind of assumes that you are familiar with what we talked about previously. So previously, Liz laid out her uh, argument, uh, her version of Pascal's wager and defended uh, that version against lot like i can't remember if we had like 10 different objections it was a lot of objections uh and that video has done really really well so i'm i'm really excited about that it's uh for for you to not have a youtube channel that video has gotten a lot of views at least you know relative to to what i normally get so i'm really proud of that video and pleased with how that turned out so go and watch it all right i I don't want to take much longer though so let's jump in to this paper liz already mentioned it it's titled Wagering Against Divine Hiddenness, and uh, it was really, really fun to read, and uh, a really unique take. So I think you're going to enjoy this. Uh, Whatever side of the issue you come down on, I had people from Facebook, uh, atheists, theists alike, who said, this was a great paper. This was fun, uh, and it was was very insightful. So you should be proud of yourself, Liz. (laughs) Yeah, well, and I think probably atheists and theists alike may both think that what I have to say is crazy also. So <laughs> you're being very nice, but like you said, this is definitely a, a unique kind of take on the, the problem. And I think there are other other ways to answer it as well. But um, but yeah, you don't have to, I guess, endorse my solution to be, you know, a theist or think this argument fails. But yeah, um, I think it's a fun, it's a fun topic. It's a fun a uh, fun problem and fun potential solution, hopefully. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's jump in then. So I'm going to put up, I'm trying something new still. Uh, I'm always trying to just model uh, the success that I see from other apologists on YouTube. And uh, so I'm going to put up a little slide here. 
And let me make sure this is my first time trying this, so we'll see if it works. Can can you see that? Well, I don't know. Can you see that? I believe so. Okay, yeah, it's you can't see it, Liz, because it's from it's from Skype, but I believe YouTube can. Okay. okay, so what I've just put up is the argument from Divine Hiddenness that John Schellenberg offers, and uh, Liz put this right at the beginning of her paper. So, Liz, you can lay out for us the argument from Divine Hiddenness. Yeah, really quick before I do that, I saw Cameron is watching, which is great. Hi, Cameron. Um, but he said, I'm hard to hear or um, I'm quiet. Is oh, there a way to yes. turn up my, my volume? I don't know how to do that. So. Yeah, I will. <laughs> We're trying to figure it out. All right. If not, it's it's fine. I, I mean, I'm a loud person, so I can just talk loud. I do that anyway. But... No, no. <laughs> Hold on. Okay. From Scott. Oh, I think I know why. Okay. Yeah, I think I know why that happened. All right, talk okay. now, Liz. Um, All right, is this better? Um, Cameron and I guess Slam RN both mentioned it. Uh, can you guys hear me better? Hopefully, I think maybe we should take it as a yes, and then they can yeah tell me if, if I'm not <laughs> loud enough. Okay. Yeah, so they said they wanna... they said they hear you. Okay. Oh great. Okay. Awesome. Cool. So yeah, so this is the basic argument uh, John Schellenberg makes for the hiddenness of God. And um, yeah, so it has three premises and then two conclusions kind of derived from those premises. So premise one says, if God exists, then God is perfectly loving. And I guess most people responding to the argument to not to deny this premise, especially if you kind of have a traditional conception of God. Most people think God's you know, omnibenevolent, omnibenevolent are all loving. Um, but the argument has two more premises. So premise two says, if a perfectly loving God exists, then non-resistant non-belief does not occur. Um, so I guess, yeah, maybe I can just go ahead and define non-resistant non-belief if that's okay. Yeah, go um, for it. And, and basically what non-resistant non-belief is, it's um, someone's a non-resistant non-believer if they don't believe in God through no fault of their own. So the focus here is whether they're blameworthy for their lack of belief in God. So the word resistant might be um, a little weird if resistance and blame come apart in certain cases. So you can just think about it as blame. Are they blameworthy or culpable or is it their own fault that they don't believe in God? And so the idea is that if this perfectly loving God exists, then he would want to be in relationship with all people because he would want to be in relationship with all people, um, there wouldn't be people that didn't believe in him uh, unless it was their own fault. That's kind of what the premise is saying. It's like, it, unless it's their own fault, you know, God would um, create a world such that he could be in a relationship with everyone. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the second premise. And then the third premise basically just says there are non-resistant non-believers. So there are people who, through no fault in the, of their own, just don't believe in God. Um, and then from that, we can conclude that no perfectly loving God exists. And if, you know, God has to be perfectly loving, then we would just say that God doesn't exist in general. Um, so that's basically the argument. I think this argument has actually gotten quite a bit of attention. It's pretty interesting. I think for a while, the problem of evil was sort of the main focus of a lot of, uh, at least, at least the main kind of anti-theistic argument but i think a lot of people have become really interested in the hiddenness argument and then there's also debate about the relationship between the divine hiddenness argument and the argument from evil and whether one of those reduces to the other or not so there's a lot of interesting questions here but um this argument i think has yeah a lot of people have been interested in it uh especially recently among kind of philosophers of religion definitely and it seems to comment on youtube as well from uh youtube mm -hmm. atheists it, it gets talked about a lot. I think um, uh, Justin Schieber and uh, Ben Watkins from Real A Theology, you may not have know them, but they're yeah, fairly... Yeah, I don't know them. They're, they're more of the thoughtful kind of atheists than your your typical okay. ones. They're, they're definitely more philosophically informed. 
and uh, and this is like a, a very uh, important argument in their arsenal. I feel like they frequently bring it up. Uh, so I want I Just wanted curious, to have. A, do they? Oh, sorry. Do they do it in this form? Like, is this a common form on YouTube as well? I know this is common among philosophers. Um, but I don't do, know. Do you know. I don't know if they use this deductive form. Um, okay. I and we'll we'll talk about kind of your uh, inductive version where uh, in a minute, but uh, yeah. I'm not. I can't remember. I remember they were on. Maybe Cameron can tell us. He's watching. They were on Cameron's um, uh, show or his channel. And they debated a, cu- uh, a couple of people that came brought You know, Josh Peck? Or pro- Josh Parikh. Josh Parikh, I think. Um, uh, I don't think I do, actually. Anyway. I need to be more up on my YouTube. Well, he's a, no, he's a <laughs> philosopher. <YouTube> <laughs> he's a philosopher. Oh, and, oh uh, okay. Uh, mm, yeah, I don't know him. Him and, and Blake Genta, who I've had on. Uh, okay. Talked about, uh, or did that dialogue with Justin Schieber and Ben Watkins. But anyway, it is well known. I can't remember if they used the deductive, though. Okay. Yeah. Just curious. Just curious. Yeah. So the I think the deductive version is is very common among among philosophers. So yeah. Okay. Well, uh, now that we've laid out the argument and you've defined what non-resistant non-belief is, because that's really important. Uh, we want to be clear on on that term because I feel like the whole argument really that and and God's love uh, kind of make the whole mm-hmm. argument. <laughs> so. Uh, let's talk about then what is, uh, or, or better yet, how have theists traditionally uh, responded to this argument? Yeah, so most theists um, either deny premise two, or I think, I, I don't know if we had it as S2, but the second premise or the third premise, mm-hmm. basically. Uh, like I said, most theists aren't going to be like, oh, just kidding, God's not actually loving, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, so they're either going to say that uh, God's being perfectly loving is actually consistent with the existence of non-resistant non-belief. Um, and you could give various reasons for that. A really common one is sort of a greater goods argument. Uh, you know, a perfectly loving God would allow non-resistant non-belief if there was some overriding greater good. Mm-hmm. So that actually in some ways parallels a common response to the problem of evil as well. Um, a response that doesn't really have a parallel uh, with the problem of evil <laughs> is actually to just deny that there's non-resistant non-believers at all. That would be like so denying say, that there's nope, evil. <laughs> everyone who doesn't believe in God. Yeah, exactly. So I was like, yeah, no one really denies that there's evil. Um, but yeah, so the the version, the, the hiddenness w- version though, which people do actually argue, is to say that um, actually everyone who doesn't believe in God is blameworthy for it. Um, so that's, I mean, that's a pretty strong claim, but people have defended it. Um, so I think probably denying the second premise is more common, but yeah, people have definitely denied the third as well. Okay. So (laughs) then, uh, we'll, we'll see in a minute exactly, uh, how you go about responding, but before you say how you do it, what is at bottom, the most basic version you can give me, what's the fundamental claim of your paper overall? Yeah, so here's basically what I wanted to argue for in this paper. It's that given that a version of Pascal's wager is successful, we don't have a good reason to think that there's a lot of non-resistant non-believers. So in other words, uh, resistant non-belief is more common than we might have thought. Um, And I know, I know this doesn't technically mean one of the premises here is false, so we're going to talk about that in a second. But basically, I think Pascal's wager and the fact that it's successful uh, gives us a reason to basically just think there's a lot less non-resistant non-believers than we might have thought. Mm. Very good. And <clears throat> hopefully, if you're watching this, uh, you will you will be familiar with the playlist of videos that I've made on Pascal's wager. So I'll go ahead and plug that now. I love Pascal's wager. <laughs> That's why I've, <laughs> I've devoted a whole series to it. I think it's so undervalued and uh, it has a lot of application to, to areas that I don't think people have thought to apply them. And this is a great example. I think you took Pascal's mm-hmm. wager and you applied it in an area that maybe people don't typically associate. So uh, go mm-hmm. and check those videos out after you've finished the live stream. 
Uh, you will, I think, enjoy it. I based it off of Michael Rhoda's book, Taking Pascal's Wager. Um, the video, the playlist is still going. Uh, but okay, let's let's jump uh, back in. So I like this quote for the fundamental claim of your paper, and it, it just emphasized what you just said. You said in the paper, um, given the success of a version of Pascal's Wager, there is no good reason to think there are very many non-resistant non-believers. In other words, resistant non-belief is a fairly common phenomenon. So I think that that kind of sums it up nicely what what the goal is. So we're going to look at the argument that you give. uh, But um, first, at the very beginning of your paper, you say that um, there are three ways that your thesis counts against Schellenberg's argument. So I wanted to break uh, break those down. And and the first one is that you think that... um, the deductive form that the argument is in right now, and I can put that back up uh, in just a second when you start to talk, the deductive form of the argument is too coarse-grained, you call it. Um, it yes. seems to to miss some important information. So can you uh, mm-hmm. not just, you can elaborate on that, but also the, uh, the other two ways that you think your thesis counts against Schellenberg? Yeah, great. So when I say the deductive form is too coarse grained. I guess what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to push is that it can't distinguish between, I think, very different types of hiddenness problems that I think have very implication, uh, very different implications for like whether God exists or I guess the probability of theism. So to kind of illustrate this point, I start the paper early on with this uh, thought experiment. Okay, so let's say there's three worlds. And let's say in the first world, there's zero non-resistant non-believers. So there's no, there's no non-resistant non-belief. And in the second world, there's one non-resistant non-believer, you know, out of billions of people. Okay. And then in the third world, there's, you know, like 99% of people are non-resistant non-believers. So billions and billions of non-resistant non-believers. And so the thought is, sorry, I'm going to turn notifications off okay so the thought is supposed to be uh that in so in the first world we don't get an argument from head in this right because there's no non there is no non-resistant non-believer yeah but in the second world and then the third world i don't think we would judge that the probability of theism is exactly the same Mm -hmm. um in the in the second world there's only one non-resistant non-believer uh, and in the third world, almost everyone is. And and the problem with this argument is that when you look at premise three, all it says is non-resistant non-belief occurs. Mm-hmm. It doesn't say how common it is. And for it to be true, all that would be required is there to be one non-resistant non-believer. Um, so I guess what I wanted to sort of begin the paper by pushing is the amount of non-resistant non-belief actually does matter. And I think the more non-resistant non-belief there is, uh, assuming this argument is successful, the more this argument is going to lower the probability that God exists. But we shouldn't just treat all non-resistant non-belief the same because the amount the amount matters. Mm-hmm. And um, so in some ways what I'm sort of doing is, for those of you who might be familiar with some problem of evil stuff, and I don't know how many of your listeners are. Probably are. But there's also... Okay, yeah, so there's like two versions of the problem of evil as well. Uh, Sometimes they're called, uh, uh, sorry, the logical version and the evidential version Mm -hmm. uh, of evil, uh, of the problems of evil. And in some ways, I'm kind of trying to say, maybe we should think about the hiddenness argument in more of an evidential way Mm -hmm. rather than in a logical way. Um, Like you can put the problem of evil evil also in a deductive form, but uh, people have brought up sort of similar worries about that. Right. And so I'm kind of saying maybe we should see hiddenness in, in the same light. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of another way you could think about the point I'm making here. Very good. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Awesome. <laughs> so that's uh, so you you offer kind of an inductive version. Then uh, you call it the inductive hiddenness proposition, and this is it: the probability of theism is inversely correlated with the amount of non-resistant non-belief that occurs. And I think most people, at least if they're like, once they get the terms down, that just seems very intuitive. I, I mm-hmm. think that they would say, 
because I think that the evidential version of the problem of evil would seem very intuitive. If there's just barely any evil that occurs, it seems pretty easy to, to think, well, maybe God would, you know, allow some li- a, a tiny bit. Uh, but then in, in an evidential version, it's like there's this much, so much, and it's gratuitous, and it's of this nature and so forth. It just seems like it's really unlikely. You know what I mean? And I think that yeah. something similar is going on here. So you say the inductive hiddenness proposition uh, would would be a good kind of modification to this to this argument uh, because as as it stands right now, it's it's too it's overlooking some important information. Yeah, I guess it's overlooking an important distinction mm-hmm. or uh, question: how much non-resistant non-belief is there? Right. You know. So um, so yeah, that's yeah, that's exactly. Oh, by the way, I'll <laughs> pause here. Alex W. in the comment or in the live chat just said, Liz Jackson is the greatest philosopher alive. That's a really high compliment. And that's actually my fiance. I probably shouldn't say that. I should probably just be like, oh, thank you. <laughs> he might be a little biased. <laughs> no, that's, that's perfectly. Shout out to him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. That's okay. So, so the second reason that your thesis counts against Schellenberg's argument. Go, go from there. Oh, yeah. Great. Oh, so maybe I'll just say really quick. Uh, the first reason is just that I'm saying, look, there's less non-distant non-belief than we would have thought. So if the problem of divine headedness lowers the probability of theism, it doesn't do so as much as we might have thought. Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of said that already, but I just wanted to. Yeah, that's a good, that. yeah, um, good summary and yeah. connecting, connecting the dots there. Okay, so the second reason yeah. then is what? So the second reason this, uh, my argument actually, uh, you know, interacts with Schellenberg and has implications for it is because I think it could play a role in the denial of the second premise. Um, and, and that would look something like this. So this would be a broader argument than the one I make in the paper. But what you could do is you could kind of take my argument that there's less non-resistant non-belief than we might have thought previously. So maybe we thought 50% of the population was non-resistant non-believers. And now we realize it's only 20% or something. I mean, I just made those numbers up, but let's just say um, it's, probably easier to think of a, a, a greater good that would justify a, a smaller percentage of non-resistant non-belief than, than a larger percentage of non-resistant non-belief. So it kind of takes some of the burden off of greater goods defenses mm-hmm. and basically makes them easier to make because you don't have to say, oh, look, like there's, you know, all these non-resistant non-believers, it's a lot less than we thought before. Right. So we don't need as many goods or as big of goods in order to, uh, to to show that that can be justified. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost a balancing act. Like, I've got to counterweight uh, mm-hmm. this all this uh, non-resistant non-belief with, with some goods. But if we say there's not as much as we thought, uh, there's not as much non-resistant non-belief as we thought, uh, it doesn't have to be counter... Uh, countered with as many goods uh, so yeah okay yeah exactly and then exactly. the third reason that it counts uh, your thesis counts against the current form of this hiddenness argument yeah so then um the third reason maybe predictably is it uh could enable us to deny premise three so i say look um we thought there was 50 percent non-resistant non-believers there's actually 20 percent and then someone else comes along and, and gives a, another separate argument that takes that 20% to zero. So it actually, I mean, in another way, it sort of takes the burden off of arguments that try to establish there are no non resistant non-believers. Uh, while I'm not arguing that there's none, period, just based on what I'm arguing, you could do that by taking my argument and then combining it with another one to kind of push that number to zero. Mm-hmm. Very yeah. good. And I think... Uh, yeah, so those are the those are the three reasons, and we're uh, we're kind of uh, putting a little bit of we're we're putting a little bit of pressure on premise two and premise three uh, with this argument. It 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 makes the uh, those arguments that already go after premise two and premise three your uh, thesis can make those kind of arguments uh, or responses stronger. I think is the that's is exactly the idea. right. Yeah, um, that's exactly right. And yep. so. I'll, I'll, I'll pause here before we go on and say that um, if you want to hear, an, uh, I think, a really great uh, kind of summary where um, 
there's several responses given to this argument. Check out my interview with Blake, Ju- Blake Junta. Uh, we went through like five different kinds of responses. One of those is greater goods uh, in general, and another is greater goods in t- even in terms of relationship, which you might think like, what? Mm. How, is, how is, if there's non-resistant non-belief, how am I going to get greater goods in, in relationship with God? Uh, so check out that, <laughs> that interview. Um, after this is over. All right, so let's continue. Uh, you, you, your thesis is resistant non-belief is actually a really common phenomenon. So yep. what is uh, or what are the sufficient conditions for um, resistant non-belief? Yeah, great. So this is like a little bit of a, uh, a mouthful. So maybe I'll just say it and kind of explain it, but then we can kind of come back to it as need be uh, or sort of tie everything back together to this at the end. uh, So basically what I'm trying to say is you don't don't feel like you have to have all this in your brain right now. But here's the here's the conditions. So uh, so S, some individual is resistant with respect to some proposition if uh, so three three things. So the first is that she believes that she has a stronger reason to believe that then hold any other attitude towards it. Or she doesn't have that belief, but she should have that belief and she's blameworthy for the fact that she doesn't have that belief. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, that's a little complicated, but um, I'll try to explain more in a second. Uh, The second is that she has some kind of control over her doxastic attitude, her whether she believes it is basically what that means uh, towards that proposition. And then the third is that she chooses not to believe it. So basically, she thinks, I have the strongest reason to believe this thing, and she has some kind of control over that, but she just decides not to believe it anyway. So that would be one scenario. Or the other scenario is, she should think she has the strongest reason to believe that thing, um, but she doesn't for some other reason that she's blameworthy for. for. Mm -hmm. So I hope that's at least... Sorry, yeah, I, th- I think technical, but yeah, I think it's clear. It's sort of intuitive. I, I think yeah. it's clear if, if uh, you know, if this is a lot of this is technical. So if you're interested, go read the paper. But I think for our purposes, I'm following. Yeah, basically, it's saying I believe that I shouldn't believe that, or sorry, I believe that I should believe that, but I'm not going to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I can control whether I believe it. That's basically the gist of it. Yeah. Okay. So very yeah. good. Now. Since we've got the sufficient the sufficient condition for resistant non-belief, and and your claim was this is actually uh, very common, how can you show that? How can you show that that's a really common uh, that that most if if someone is in a state of non-belief, they're probably meeting that condition. Yeah. So basically, what I want to argue is that many people that don't believe in God actually have a strong reason to believe in God. Um, And they either should be aware of that or they are aware of it. And this is kind of where Pascal's wager starts to come in. Um, And the idea is that we should do the thing uh, that uh, it's called maximizes expected value. It's basically, we should do the thing that's practically rational. Um, And this is actually something Jordan talks a lot about in that playlist he talked about with Pascal's wager, but it has to do with decision theory. But basically it's just saying people should be practically rational. People should take the best means to their ends. Uh, If I give you, uh, oh, I should have come up with an example before and not on the fly, but you know, uh, I've I've got between $1 and $10, you should take $10. Yeah, (laughs) I mean, that's a super one, but Maybe you could say one. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, the, the the tip. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to diverge just too much. But the typical one that I'm like, just for quick and easy, what Pascal's wager is, uh, has to do with yeah, flipping a coin and saying, you know, if I flip this coin uh, and you call heads uh, and it lands heads, then you will get ten dollars. But if I flip this coin and you call tails then uh, you'll lose a dollar um, and something like that. And I've, I've actually got a, like a really short article that's like the simplest version of Pascal's wager to remember or something like that. And oh, it's just nice. a very easy that's- little analogy that you can offer people. But yeah, it's just you, you, should, you should call heads because the expected value is so 
much better than if you call tails um anyway uh that yep. people can check that out for, for more uh, a better example but you should do things that maximize your expected value that's the idea yeah yeah so it's basically just saying you should be practically rational <laughs> mm-hmm. uh is, is it, it, because maximizing expected value is sort of our best philosophical theory of what it means to be practically rational um so uh, I sort of just assume you should be practically rational in the paper. That's kind of just a background assumption. Um, but the main thing I argue for, and this actually comes back to a lot of the stuff we talked about in our last interview, is that uh, cultivating belief in God is going to maximize expected value. And from those two premises, it follows that uh, we should cultivate belief in God. And then you can actually stick that into my definition of resistant non-believer uh, and then it will have a bunch of implications for the hiddenness argument. Uh, maybe we can sort of come back to that at the end and focus on this shorter argument first. Yeah. And then we can kind of come back to how it relates to hiddenness because there are a lot of moving parts in this paper. Actually, when I was rereading it, I was like, oh, man, like, this is kind of complex. So <laughs> there <laughs> yeah. there are several moving parts, but but I was able to follow and, and it uh, if I guess where I'm familiar with Pascal's wager, that part didn't confuse me at all like I'm very familiar with that and comfortable with that stuff now and so I was able to focus more on how you're going to apply it but if somebody's brand new to Pascal's wager they may get a sense of like whoa there's like multiple things going on here Uh, but just to just to lay out this argument that you're offering um, to show that people fulfill that condition uh, of uh, resistant non-belief this is the argument it's got three steps I just want to make it clear for the viewers Um, Premise one, one should perform the action that maximizes expected value. And we're just kind of assuming that. We're we're not, uh, you mentioned in the paper, there are certain paradoxes that people offer. But by and large, this is a pretty common assumption, not just among like people like me, laymen, but even among philosophers. Uh, This is is not uh, something that we have to really worry too much about. Uh, the paradoxes are interesting, but I don't think that they're uh, insuperable. So yeah. premise two, cultivating belief in God maximizes expected value. That's where we're going to spend the, the bulk of this conversation is on premise two. Um, mm-hmm. And then three, therefore, one should cultivate belief in God. So that's the little argument that you give. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, I guess if you, I, I'll, I'll say this maybe, uh, and, and it may come up, but just so people kind of connect the dots, you mentioned this in the paper that the way that uh, typically the the hiddenness argument is defended, when when uh, when the person offering the argument says that resistant non-belief occurs, they they try to defend that premise by showing that somebody's fulfilled their epistemic duty and the the key word there's on the epistemic part so they've they've you know investigated this question and done their due diligence and you know hearing both sides and all that and at the end they come up with saying you know i just can't uh believe that god exists uh even though that mm-hmm. would i would love to have a relationship if he did um so the focus is is almost really entirely on epistemic duty but what you do that's interesting is you say, well, wait, it's not just epistemic duty that we should worry about. That is important. That's part of the conversation. But there's this pragmatic consideration that we also have to consider, not just an epistemic consideration, but pragmatic considerations as well. And um, if somebody fails to do, uh, you know, say they do their epistemic duty, but they don't do their pragmatic duty, then they're resistant. Am I understanding? Mm-hmm. Am I understanding that correctly from the paper? Yes. No. I'm so glad you said that actually, because that was a really key point in the paper, and partially because of multiple moving parts, I just kind of forgot to say it. But that's exactly right. It's like we, especially when we think about belief, you know, we just really focus on epistemic stuff. But there's a lot of belief stuff, or at least stuff that's relevant to belief. Uh, this whole entire practical realm. And people have just kind of been ignoring it. So I'm kind of saying, hey, look, we should pay attention to this as well. Mm-hmm. Like this has a bearing on uh, maybe what we should believe, but we'll get we'll get into this later. But even if not, what we should believe, things that affect our beliefs and actions that we take. 
Uh, and it's really important. So yeah, that's, I, yeah. I'm so glad you brought that up. It's, yeah. So totally as bad. you're, yeah. as you're listening, that's really, I think a really important point is that there's actually two kind of duties going on. There's an epistemic one and a pragmatic one and somebody mm-hmm. can meet the epistemic duty and fail and it's their fault. It's not the fault of somebody else. It's their fault. Uh, they're to blame for the, for the failure of their uh, meeting their pragmatic duty uh, and so they can, they end up counting as resistant, and that's where we end up saying there we've actually really weakened the idea that there's a lot of non-resistant non-believers because it seems like there's probably a lot of people who are failing to satisfy their pragmatic uh, duties. Yep, exactly right, exactly. Okay, so then uh, let's move on uh, to premise two. Let's focus in. I gave that three-step argument. Premise two said, cultivating belief in God maximizes expected value. So you actually give kind of three lines of defense of premise two. So walk us through those three defenses. Yeah, great. So um, three main things that I kind of focus on to defend premise two. Okay, so the first thing is that um, it's not impossible to get infinite utility. So this is kind of responding to the person that says, oh yeah, I just have, there's just zero probability of heaven, you know? Um, So what I try to do is basically say, we shouldn't say that going to heaven or hell um, has a zero probability. Um, And I also talk about uh, uh, infinitesimal probabilities, which basically means it's infinitely close to zero. Um, And so basically what I sort of point out there is we'll look, there's a lot of smart people that believe in an afterlife. Uh, there's a lot of disagreement and live debate about whether there's an afterlife, whether it exists. And, um, you know, some interesting arguments, you know, even that there's an afterlife. Now, I'm not trying to say, and then this means that there's an afterlife. I'm just saying we shouldn't give it probability zero. Um, and I also think it's worth noting here that a lot of people that work on probability theory think that the only things we should assign probability zero to are either contradictions or uh, just total impossibilities, something that's um, basically like contains a contradiction inside of it, like, you know, two plus two equals five or something. Uh, and so to say, like, there's an afterlife, uh, that, that that's not something that would fall under that uh, umbrella of that. So uh, so that's, that's sort of the first step is I try to basically say there's at least some chance that there's an afterlife, even if it's super, 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 super small. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, I'll mention one. You, It's funny because this, this paper, like you said, is multi-layered. So like when you make a point, you yeah. like give a reason <laughs> in support of it. And then you give yeah. a reason in support of your reason. And so it, it, it's like tiered. But um, something, uh, a couple of, of, of points in the paper about uh, it being, there's a non-zero non-infinitesimal chance of getting infinite utility. Uh, If I remember correctly, one of them was, usually we only assign zero probability to things that are contradictory. And this Mm -hmm. doesn't seem, they're, they're, you know, somebody would have to lay out a pretty good argument, I feel like, to show that somehow the afterlife is like a contradiction of some kind. Um, So it seems like there's a non-zero chance there because it's there's not a contradiction going on here. The second reason I think you said was that um, there's an act- there's an argument you can make from um, uh, something about like uh, peers, uh, p- uh, even though there's peer disagreement, like there's really smart, intelligent people who th- mm-hmm. who would agree with this, uh, who would agree there's a non-zero, non-infinitesimal chance of getting infinite utility, and for that alone, it seems like. Uh, that that offers some reason to think it's non-zero. We're not saying it's probable. We're just saying it's not zero. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I can't remember the third. I can't remember the third reason off the top of my head. But there was there was a third reason in the paper for thinking it's it's not zero. Yeah, I, I wait. Oh, it was just that um, you know, if God exists. Uh, then God would sort of have the power and possibility of giving us uh, an infinite afterlife. And so if you think there's even some chance that there's an all powerful uh, God, yes. then that sort of, uh, that would make it non-zero you know, at least raises the probability a little bit, even mm-hmm. if it's not uh, like you said, it's not like it's a high probability or anything like yeah. that. 
So yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's kind of step one. Uh, in as we're like almost building a case for premise two that cultivating belief in God maximizes your expected value. That step one is yep. just to just to acknowledge there's a non-zero, non-infinitesimal chance of getting infinite utility. That's step one. Yep. And we've given some reasons for that. Now, step two there was what? Yeah. So step two was actually basically a very short summary of the paper we discussed in our last interview. Uh, <laughs> uh, partially because, you know, there's this big problem that has to do with the way we reason about infinities and decision theory, which we talked about a lot last time. And basically, I knew that people reading this would think about that. And so I just wanted to kind of get that out of the way uh, before, you know, moving on. And um, I don't know how much of that you want to go into. We can because, so let's yeah. we can take like 10 minutes because we're at the 40 minute mark. Uh, we can take like okay. 10 minutes and just kind of summarize that a little uh, and, and go from there. This may make a good little, okay. I may isolate this clip and be like, the best argument, <laughs> the best version of Pascal's wager ever. That's what I'll title it or something. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. So basically, there's two objections to Pascal's wager, and they both have pretty much the same structure. Um, the first is what's uh, a more familiar objection, the many gods objection. And that's basically well, okay, maybe you should believe in God, but which religion should you pick? There's a lot of different religions. And if you practice Christianity and Islam turns out to be true, you're not going to go to heaven. So it's not enough to just be a theist. You have to know which religion to pick. A lot of different religions uh, are making claims about inf infinite utility, infinite afterlife, but saying that different groups of people will get the reward and different groups of people won't. Okay. So that's, that's this one worry that's this many gods objection. Um, the second worry is a little bit weirder, but I'll try to explain it. And this worry has to do with the weirdness of infinities. So um, let's say when you're deciding whether you want to take Pascal's wager and believe in God, uh, let's say there's two different actions you could do. Um, the first action is you just believe in God directly. You just, uh, let's say you can do that. Let's say you can just form belief in God. The second action is you flip a coin. If the coin lands heads, you believe in God. And if it lands tails, you don't, and you just go on with your life. Okay, so it seems like if you're trying to take Pascal's wager, if you think, yeah, I should try to believe in God, then obviously you should do the first thing and not the second thing. But here's the really weird thing, is when you have infinities at play, um, in both cases, you're gonna take the probability uh, multiply that by the utility, and then that gets you the expected value. And in one, the probability you come to believe in God is very high, or one, if it's just you just believe in God. And the other, it's, it's 0.5. But both of those numbers are, uh, when multiplied by infinity, are, are infinite. And, and when you think about it, this is actually kind of the same thing that's going on in the many gods objection, because you say, Let's say you think Christianity has a, a 0.6 probability, 60% likely to be true. Um, and you think Islam has a 0.2 probability, maybe 20% likely to be true. But in both cases, when you're trying to figure out what you should, uh, which one you should believe, you're going to take that probability and multiply it by infinity. And it's going to, they're both going to come out equal. They're both going to be infinite. So there's not really a way to compare them. Uh, in the same way, because of the weirdness of infinities, you can't really compare believing in God directly from the coin flip thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so it starts to look like, well, not like all my choices between religions, I'll have an infinite expected value that's all exactly the same. And then all my choices uh, between other actions that give me some chance of believing in God are all exactly the same. And then you start to think about it and you're like, actually anything I do could lead me to believe in God, mm -hmm. even if it's really unlikely, like drinking out of this water bottle, yeah, yeah. a text to my friend. And so then it's like, everything has an infinite expected value. What? Like, this is so weird. And <laughs> and then like, some people are like, awesome, that's great. Woohoo. And then other people are like, this is way too weird. Something's going on wrong mm -hmm. with decision theory. Um, different people in the literature actually say everything. One guy's like, hey, look, 
there is a good God. Everything has infinite expected value. <laughs> I didn't think about it that way. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I forgot who said that, but that's one of the papers. But a lot, I mean, I think most people just think, no, this is way too crazy. It, it can't be that every action has the same infinite expected value. Mm-hmm. So anyway, uh, this is, we discussed this more in um, our first interview, but basically the, the main answer, and this is what I push in, in my other paper, is that the probability of, of getting um, some infinitely valuable thing matters, right? So if you have a choice between two options, and in option A, you have a 99% chance of getting something infinitely good, and in option B, you have a 0.001% chance of getting something infinitely good, like, obviously, you should pick option A. I mean, that's, that's crazy. In the same way, if I have an $100 bill, and I say you could either have a 99% chance of getting it or a 0.01% chance of getting it, you obviously take the higher probability. Nothing's different just because it's infinite. Mm-hmm. Um, and, so, and so then the idea is that, well, when we were thinking about the many gods objection, and when we were thinking about believing in God directly versus the coin flip case, um, we, we weren't distinguishing between the probabilities of getting this, this infinitely good thing. We, weren't, uh, we, need, to, we need to make those uh, matter when it comes to the final expected values. So, so basically the idea is that when it comes to the many gods objection, you should pick the religion that you think is most likely to be true because that's going to give you the best chance at getting the infinitely good thing. And in the same way, you should believe in God directly rather than only believing in God if the coin lands heads because believing in God directly is going to give you the higher chance at infinite utility than just believing if the coin lands heads. So, so all that to say, part of what, what the, this partial defense of this idea that believing in God maximizes expected value is, is we need a way to kind of say, you need to go for the highest chance uh, at getting infinite utility. And, uh, and then we need our formal framework to, I guess, reflect that as well. But that's, that's kind of what's behind that second point. Yeah. Do you have anything to add? <laughs> there, was, there was a, I really liked the way you summarized uh, this in the paper, uh, mm-hmm. in, in the Wagering Against Divine Hiddenness paper. And you said it this mm-hmm. way. Oh. You said, put another way. When ranking the expected value of outcomes, the ones with infinite utility will always be ranked above the ones with finite utility. And among the ones with infinite utility, the ones that are more probable will be ranked among above the ones that are less probable. I thought that was just a nice, uh, simplistic mm. way of putting it. Infinites outweigh finite stuff. Uh, well, I, you know what I mean. <laughs> I don't want, I'm, yeah. I'm trying yeah, not yeah. to make it overcomplicated. But uh, yeah. we, infinite ranks above finite, and then among the infinite stuff, the ones that are more probable uh, are higher. It's it's a real simple way of putting it. So uh, that's all we, we need to, to really say about that point. So all that was just kind of a way of summarizing our previous conversation, which supports this uh, second point, that we have a meaningful way to compare infinities. That's all we're trying to stress here. There is a meaningful yeah. way to compare infinities. It's not like once you get to infinities, all hope is lost. Uh, we, we have a meaningful way to do it. Okay, yep. so um, just kind of by way of review, we said there's a non-zero, non-infinitesimal chance of getting infinite utility, and we have a meaningful way to compare infinities. Now, that puts us at this third step. So take us from there. Yeah, and so this is kind of a key claim in the paper, and um, we might refer back to this later as well. And here's the claim. The claim is that the probability that theists receive infinite utility in the afterlife, and atheists do not, is higher than the probability that atheists receive infinite utility in the afterlife. And theists do not. So basically, the idea is that it's more likely that theists go to heaven and atheists don't than that atheists go to heaven and theists don't. So that's kind of, uh, in a way, that that claim is doing a lot of work in in this paper. But I think 
most people will find it pretty intuitive. Yeah, so. and and this is helpful to clarify, and you'll probably do it too. Because when I first read it, I was like, wait a minute, will people agree with that? So think about this. You you lay it out, <laughs> um, which you, you may be doing that. I'm sorry. Well, I don't see it on the papers in the outline, so I want to make sure I say it. Uh, yeah. So think about these three alternatives if you're watching. <laughs> Let me find it because I know I had it. Where'd it go? <laughs> There's several pages. Well, I could probably just go off of it from... It's page 98 of the paper, maybe? That's probably right. Um... <clears throat> no? Well, wait. Oh, maybe I don't know what you're thinking. Yes, of. yes, yes. It is 98. It is 98. You're, okay. you're right with me. We usually are on the same wavelength. Okay. So here's the three alternatives if you're watching. And just ask yourself, you know, how uh, does, this, does, this seem like heart, does this seem like it agrees with your intuitions or not? Okay. So here's the three alternatives. And then we're going to make a claim. First, theists receive infinite utility. Atheists do not. That's one possibility. A second possibility. Atheists receive infinite utility. Theists do not. Okay. And then the third one. Atheists and theists receive the same infinite utility. Okay. Now, those are three possible states, right? Those are three ways things could be. Um, the thing is, the third one there, atheists and theists receive the same infinite utility. It doesn't matter what you believe on that view. So we can just set that one aside. It doesn't matter. Um, so then you're left with the first or the second alternative. Theists receive infinite utility. Atheists do not. Do you think that's true? Or at least more likely than the other one, that atheists receive infinite utility and theists do not? I think most people are going to side with that first one and say, um, theists receive infinite utility and atheists don't. That seems more likely than the other one, that atheists receive infinite utility and theists don't. Now, you could say, you could be of the mind... But in the end, atheists and, rece and theists receive the same utility. Okay, that's fine. It doesn't matter. We can set that to the side. Which of the other two do you think is more likely than the other? I am I following correctly? Exactly, yeah. And actually, I think um, on one of the Facebook threads, someone asked a question about universalism. Was it Zach, I think? Zach, yeah. Um, yeah, and so I think this actually uh, interacts, interacts well with that. And it's basically like, yeah, I mean, you could think in the end, uh, you could even believe, you know, everyone goes to heaven, right? But as long as you think that there's some chance that you're wrong, um, th like, then Pascal's wager becomes relevant again, mm -hmm. right? And then you kind of have to think, is it more likely that theists receive infinite utility and atheists don't, or that atheists do and theists don't? So, so all of this is consistent with even believing universalism, um, and I think the only way that it wouldn't really be relevant is if you just thought universalism had probability one, you know, like there's no chance that you're wrong about it. And that's a pretty strong claim. So yeah. um, I thought I would kind of add that in there because he had asked about that. Yeah, that was, that was a good point. And so, uh, <laughs> yeah. okay, so I think we've kind of laid out the, the three steps. We said there's a non-zero, non-infinitesimal chance of getting infinite utility. Two, uh, we have a meaningful way to compare infinities. And three, the probability that theists receive infinite utility in the afterlife and atheists don't is higher than the probability that atheists receive infinite utility in the afterlife and theists don't. Um, that last one, I, I think most people, once you lay out the three options, it's going to be pretty intuitive what uh, that, that that one's the case. Um, okay. Do you have anything else to say about about those three steps there? Yeah, so I mean, I guess I just, once we kind of have those three steps, that's pretty much what you need for the really kind of basic version of the wager that I'm going for. Mm -hmm. uh, and this basic version of the wager basically just says, look, if it's more likely that theists receive infinite utility than atheists do, uh, we have a meaningful way to compare infinite utilities, and there's at least some chance that you get infinite utility then it's gonna maximize expected value to believe in God rather than not. Um, and there's sort of a, if you wanna look at the paper 
there's a little bit of, of math I do behind that. But basically from those three steps, um, the idea that believing in God maximizes expected value follows. Yeah. So, and so, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, that That's your way of defending. Essentially, the wager is your way of supporting in that original argument we gave that cultivating belief in God uh, maximizes your expected value, right? Exactly. So we, we laid exactly. out those three steps just now, and that was our way of supporting premise two. Um, yep. So at this point, you anticipate, and we've already got people in the live chat. I, I never know how to say his name. I think it's Zaned Selena. It's not his real name. I remember it's it's his his real name's something different, but his, his YouTube name's Zane Selena. So he's already anticipating the first objection. So we'll... Uh, oh, nice. We'll we'll do this. So now that we've kind of laid out the wager in support of that second premise, that cultivating belief in God maximizes the expected value, people are going to make objections. So in yeah. the paper, you talk about um, three different objections that are that you, that are very common that you would think it would come up at this point. Zane's brought up the first one. The first one is that belief is involuntary. You can't choose what you want to believe. And Zane even gave the uh, example in the chat. Uh, he said, um, you can't choose to believe that the moon is made of cheese. Uh, so, <laughs> what, what, what do we say in response when people say belief is involuntary? Does that undermine your wager? Yeah, good. Um, <laughs> so, I'm actually one of those very weird people that uh, actually doesn't think belief is involuntary. And I think there are cases where belief is voluntary, but uh, most philosophers disagree with me and a lot of, a lot of non philosophers disagree with me. So, you know, we could do a whole nother video on that actually. So I'm just going to set that aside for now. Okay. Um, I do think there are cases, even theistic cases where, where we can just believe it well, but um that's not what I talk about in the paper. I just wanted to say that to be extra controversial. Um, <laughs> in the paper, <laughs> what I talk about is that we don't have to make it about forming a belief directly. And in fact, that's actually why in the argument, I intentionally put it as cultivating belief in God rather than just believing in God in the same way you pick your cup up off the table or walk across the room or something. Um, and, and I do think we have control over um, habits that affect our beliefs and actions that affect our beliefs. And uh, things we do can make it more or less likely that we'll believe in God or not believe in God. So in this paper, I really want to focus on what beliefs we try to cultivate or, or don't try to cultivate, rather than just forming a belief in some kind of immediate decision. Yeah. So. And, and that's how... Uh... I would like maybe during the Q&A, we'll come back to the belief thing, uh, which we may, you've written a whole paper on it, if I remember correctly. Uh, mm -hmm. And so maybe I'll have you on a third time. We'll have a little trilogy, but possibly. But uh, I would like that. That'd be fun. <laughs> uh, so there, the way that I talk about it is not in terms of uh, choosing to believe something, but you can choose uh, commitment so you don't necessarily know if it's the case or not. You can be honest about that. Uh, that's the way that Rhoda talks about it. And I think most people, that makes a lot of sense to them when you put it that way, that I can commit to something and acknowledge, I don't know if it's the case or not, but I'm still going to uh, commit to, and, and I think it fits nicely with what you're saying here, certain belief-forming habits. Like, you know, if I want to cultivate this belief, then I'm gonna perf I'm gonna engage in these certain actions, but I can be honest throughout the entire process. At no point am I trying to, you know, tell myself fake it till you make it or something like that. It's not cheesy like that. We do this in yeah. other in other areas of life all the time. Uh, I was just about to say that actually. I feel like people are like, that's weird. It's not at all. Like we start grad school. We have we don't know if we're gonna finish. You know, we don't know if we're gonna successfully get the PhD, but we commit to it anyway. You know, mm -hmm. it's our goal to do it, even if yeah, I don't believe I'm definitely going to do this. It, it's too far down the road, you know? So marriage, I think, is like this. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of things that are like this. And yeah, I think sometimes people think, no, that's so weird. That's such a, you know, why would you do that if you don't believe it? No, we do this all the time. We do this all the time. So. 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of the first line of objection is, well, belief is involuntary. So your premise two is indefensible. And you can say, well, I'm not, uh, even though you, you could say, even though I think that there are cases where belief is voluntary, that's not essential to my defense of that second premise. And I can acknowledge that uh, just engaging in uh, habits and actions that cultivate belief, that's sufficient. That's all, that's all I need. Um, I don't have to say that belief is voluntary. Okay, that's first line of objection. Second one is that God wouldn't reward someone who believes only for pragmatic reasons. Uh, he knows, you know, better than that. He can see that they're just doing it out of selfish gain. Uh, so how do you respond there? Yeah, I mean, there's so much to say about this. So I actually have some stuff on that line. And then as you say it, like five more things pop into my head. So uh, we'll cover some of it and we can always come back to it too. So, I mean, the first thing to say is, um, I mean, I just, part of part of what we talked about at the beginning is that uh, our best theory of practical rationality is that you should maximize expected value. And so I guess I'm sort of assuming that God knows that that's a good theory of practical rationality. And people who, um, you know, whose belief forming habits uh, follow our best theory of practical rationality, uh, I, I guess if, if they are really doing, doing the right thing, doing the rational thing, then it's hard for me to see why I guess God would have a problem with that. But um, in a way, I, what I'm saying is, I guess I'm ch- that's challenging a premise that I'm sort of assuming to be true, which is that we should maximize expected value. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's like the first like small thing, I guess. Um, and I guess I sort of touched on this a little bit in the first response. But again, I'm not trying to say that we should believe for pragmatic reasons, right? I'm trying to say that we should take certain actions or habits that might have an effect on our beliefs, um, but we should do those things for pragmatic reasons. And of course we should do, do those things for pragmatic reasons. I mean, those are the primary reasons that we act, mm-hmm. uh, practical and, and I guess in some cases moral reasons. Um, but but I'm not saying you should just believe something directly for pragmatic reasons. Yeah, again, you could think about this like a commitment like we were just talking about. Um, and so I, I don't think the argument is as intuitive or has as much weight when when you kind of move it from belief to a series of actions instead. Um, so that's another thing to say. Um, and I guess like another thing I wanted to add too is that I think there are ways of thinking about the wager and taking the wager. And I think you actually point this out really nicely in that playlist that you have about Pascal's wager. Um, but there's ways of thinking about it and doing it that sound really bad and sound really selfish. But there's ways of thinking about and doing it that aren't selfish at all and in fact are really selfless. Mm-hmm. Um, so you could just say like, I just want all the reward and pleasure from heaven and I don't care about anyone else. You know, I mean, you can you can frame it in that way. I'm not saying you can't. But you can also frame it in a way that's like, well, look, like if if God existed, that would be pretty cool. Like that like there's an there's an all-powerful being who mm-hmm. made the world and loves us and that's someone I would want to be in a relationship with. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I, maybe my evidence doesn't fully allow me to believe in God right now. I just, I'm worried about the problem of evil, the problem of divine goodness or whatever. Um, but but I want to pursue that anyway. And I want to, uh, you know, seek that relationship or commit to trying to be in that relationship, even if my beliefs aren't quite there. Mm-hmm. And And I don't think that that's selfish at all. I mean, I think that that just makes sense. I think that that's totally reasonable way to think about it. And it's not, you're not doing it uh, like, cause you're trying to, yeah, like do some, like it's not this selfish thing. So, um, so I think that there's different ways of thinking about the motives involved here, but some of the motives are actually, are, are totally innocent and even admirable, I think. Yeah. Um, so, so that's, that's another thing to say. Um, I don't know if you also want me to say, I, I don't know if, yeah, you want to keep going or yeah. Uh, so I think that's enough for the God wouldn't reward someone who believes just for pragmatic reasons, that kind of objection. So the third one, and this is the big one. I feel like this is the, 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 uh, this one and the other that you mentioned where it's like infinities make things just go, you know, ballistic at some point and and we get absurd, uh, things. Uh, it's the third objection is the many gods objection. And, uh, Zane kind of is it's like he's anticipating I know he, he well I, he might have Reggie paper but um 
he's he's just anticipating one objection after that. He said, couldn't Pascal's huh. wager be used to justify a belief in any god? And this is kind of the many the the many gods objection. It's it's that you know if if even if Pascal's wager is successful, it doesn't tell you which religion to pick. It could be any of them. So if it could be if it's good to justify anything, it's good for nothing. That's the kind of uh, mm-hmm. idea. So how can we respond to the many gods objection? So I want to say two things about this. Okay. So the first thing is that because we're thinking about this in the context of the divine headedness argument and the context of what it would mean to um, be a non non-believer versus being someone who's in relationship with God and can kind of experience that great good and experience God's love. Um, one thing to say is that, uh, sorry, I'm just looking at the paper really quick. Oh, um, if we're just trying to use this, I guess, as a direct response to Schellenberg, then in some cases, having general theistic beliefs can actually allow you to have that relationship with God, um, even if you don't have kind of every single theological doctrine correct or all the correct beliefs about God. Right. So if we're thinking about, well, if Schellenberg's saying, look, um, God can't exist because of all these people that don't know which religion's correct or whatever, well, that might not prevent them from actually entering into a relationship with God and kind of experiencing God's love. So I do think it's just kind of important to note that in the context of divine hiddenness, that in order to have that relationship with God, you don't necessarily have to have all the correct beliefs about God, or maybe not even be practicing the correct, um, the correct religion. Um, but I think, uh, I guess, in, in the context of Pascal's wager, uh, the answer I sort of alluded to earlier about uh, being able to compare infinities with each other is the best response to this uh, many gods objections to Pascal's wager. And so basically, if decision theory can enable us to capture uh, not all infinities are the same, but the probability matters, mm-hmm. uh, then what you should do is you should go in for the religion that you think has the highest probability. Um, and so the many gods objection just kind of dissolves. I mean, you could still, there are still like specific versions of it. You could bring up like, what if two religions have the same probability and mm-hmm. this sort of thing. But, but really the really simple answer to it is just go in for the religion with the highest probability. Um, and so I think that's that's kind of cool because it's this huge problem that a lot of people have really pushed against the wager, and I think the answer to it is is kind of simple. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it would almost be like yeah. we can use your door analogy. Now I'm just doing this off the top of my head, but if it was like, yeah. hey, you've got uh, just just as there's infinitely many religion religions, there's infinitely many doors you could walk through, and behind every door there's an infinite utility. So what do you do? Uh, or, or, uh, or, or better yet, there could be an infinite utility behind yeah, every door. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And so yeah. you're res- the person, if somebody's like, so there you go, you're, if you make a little decision matrix, it's going to be pointless, buddy, because it it's not mm-hmm. going to tell you which door to walk through. And we want to say, but wait, there could be infinite utility behind these doors, but behind one of these doors. And we don't know which one. So which one seems to be most likely to have the infinite utility behind it? Can we figure that out? Can we look at maybe some evidence to figure that out? And then Mm -hmm. whichever one, even if it's a small number by the time you compare it all, you know, whichever one has the, uh, the best chance of having an infinite utility behind it, that's the door you should walk through. Uh, that's the kind of answer to the, to the many gods objection. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to do in my playlist of videos is I lay out the wager and then that's like stage one. Uh, it's uh, Stage one is almost saying walk through uh, the door that's most probable. And then stage two is now let's look at some evidence and see uh, which one probably has utility behind it. So I don't think that the many gods objection is insuperable. I don't know. You, you, you can tell me... Yeah. Uh, maybe my analogy is bad, but that's how I think of it. No, no, it's it's great. I, I, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And I mean, you know, you can 
there's little details you can fiddle with to create small problems. But I really think it's actually this really big problem with a really simple answer uh, that kind of answers like most versions uh, mm -hmm. of it. And, and yeah, I think that analogy is great. I think it, it really shows how obviously you should go for the higher probability one. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. Totally. So just to kind of uh, get us to this point, and then this is like the critical moment where we say, okay, now that we've kind of got the wager in place and uh, we've defended it against objections, it seems solid. Uh, now we're going to apply this to the problem of divine hiddenness. So take, take us from there. We've got the wager in place. How does your argument mm -hmm. interact with Schellenberg at this point? Yeah, great. So basically what I take us to have established so far is that uh, we should cultivate belief in God. That's, that's, kind of what everything what we've, we've to so tried far. to do so That's far. Not, that was it was a lot of layers and a lot of details but what i hope we've established is that we should cultivate belief in god right mm -hmm. um i mean that's in and of itself very controversial but what i want to say is if that's true that actually gives us a kind of interesting response to uh the divine headedness uh argument and the reason is because i think if it's true that we should cultivate belief in god then a lot more people are going to be blameworthy for not believing in God. So the reason is, um, is because of actually a principle that I defend in the last section of this paper. And here's the principle. It says, if there's a proposition that you should believe, then the higher the stakes are with respect to that thing you should believe, the more likely that it, you're blameworthy for not believing it or at least trying to believe it. So it's basically saying if you should believe something, then the higher the stakes are, uh, the more likely it is that you're going to be blameworthy for not believing it. Um, so let me give a, a kind of example to illustrate that and maybe motivate it a little bit. And um, in this example, again, there's sort of three scenarios. So let's say I have a friend who comes over and she wants a snack. And I just made two sandwiches, an almond butter one and a peanut butter one. And um, they're both in the fridge. I don't know which one's which. Uh, I just grab one and, and give it to her. And then she eats it. Okay. It's totally fine. She likes both. It doesn't really matter if I grab the almond butter one or the peanut butter one. So that's the first scenario. Um, the second scenario, <clears throat> let's say I know that she's deathly allergic Oh, wait, sorry, that's the third scenario. Yeah, yeah, second that's scenario, the third one. Sorry, 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 I jumped, I jumped the gun. Uh, the second scenario, I know that she doesn't like peanut butter. She just thinks it's gross and she would probably spit it out. Um, and then if I just go in the fridge and just grab a sandwich and hand it to her, uh, it seems like, well, you maybe you should have checked and seen which one was the peanut butter one and then tried to give her the almond butter one. And, like, your friend might even be mad at you if you knew that she didn't like peanut butter and you made no effort to try to give her the almond butter sandwich. Um, so it kind of, we start to think, maybe you're kind of blameworthy for not checking and not, you know, trying to believe, you know, trying to figure out if you're giving her the almond butter one or the peanut butter one. Okay, so here's a third scenario. This is the one I <laughs> accidentally spoiled. So your friend's deathly allergic to peanut butter. So she could go to the hospital or even die if she eats peanuts. And then let's say she comes over, asks for a snack, and you just grab a random sandwich and hand it to her. Um, there's a 50-50 chance that your friend, you know, goes to the hospital or something really serious happens to your friend because she has this terrible allergy. And so, um, and so if you just grab a sandwich at random and don't try to figure out which sandwich has peanut butter in it, uh, you're definitely blameworthy. I mean, we have that intuition very clearly. And so the idea is that in each scenario, the stakes got a little bit higher. And um, it, in each scenario, we sort of felt more strongly that you should go find out whether mm -hmm. the sandwich you're handing to her is the peanut butter sandwich or not. Mm -hmm. so, um, so the idea is that when you should believe a proposition, as the stakes get higher, uh, then it's more likely you're going to be blameworthy for not believing that proposition. Mm -hmm. Um, so we can take that then and apply it to belief in God. And this is kind of our final big step. Yeah, this is, and so the, this idea is the crucial is that, step. <laughs> this is the crucial step. Yeah. 
so the idea is that <clears throat> um, we've sort of established that people should believe in God. And the stakes are extremely high with respect to the question of whether God exists. They're infinitely high, right? Um, and so if people just kind of live their lives going about their business, sort of ignoring questions about God and whether God exists, then the thought is because the stakes are so high, people are actually blameworthy for that. And if they had gone and done research, done investigation, maybe like tried to seek God, tried to have that relationship with God, um, they might have been surprised. They might have even found evidence that they thought wasn't there. And so I basically, what I'm trying to push is that there's a bunch of people who we might have thought, oh, they're non-resistant non-believers. You know, they, they did a little research and like their evidence just doesn't justify belief. But I'm saying, no, there's all these practical considerations that we're not thinking about. The stakes are super, super high. Mm -hmm. So these people actually aren't non-resistant non-believers because they either ignored questions about theism, they didn't come to them with an open mind, they didn't genuinely seek God, um, et cetera. And so the thought is, I think people are blameworthy for the fact that they don't believe in God or they don't, they're not attempting to believe in God or they're not seeking a relationship with God because the stakes are so high, because they're not doing their practical duty. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of, uh, I guess, an, an intuitive gloss on kind of what I'm pushing. Perfect. Okay. So that pretty much rounds, rounds it out. Uh, and we're getting near the end. So just to kind of recap, and you, you've already kind of recapped, but I'll, I'll do it and, and you can add and tell me where I get it wrong if I get it wrong. So we started with this argument from divine hiddenness. And as I mentioned, it kind of hinges on two things. One is that God's loving and he's going to do everything he can to be in relationship with someone uh, if they're willing to, to be in relationship with them. Um, but that would involve that they believe that he exists. And there are these people that say they're willing to uh, believe in him if they just, you know, had sufficient evidence, but they just, in all honesty, don't see the sufficient evidence. And so they, these kinds of people, these non-resistant non-believers, count as evidence against God. That's the, I, the kind of idea. And so what your strategy is, is to say, well, do we have really good reasons to think that there are non-resistant non non-believers? Um, it seems like there's, there's not very good reasons to think there are many people like that. And uh, to show that, you offer this uh, argument. And uh, the crucial premise in that argument was, look, people should cultivate belief in God. And as to support that, that crucial premise, we just offer Pascal's wager and defend it against objections. And once that's in place, then we can say, look, to count as a non-resistant non-believer, you not only have to have done your epistemic duty, you also have to have done what uh, is rational to do, this pragma these pragmatic considerations. And even if somebody you know, has investigated the arguments and so forth, but they're not taking seriously into consideration these pragmatic reasons, then they fail to fulfill their duty and they're blameworthy. And so then you have resistant uh, non-believers. And the pragmatic considerations are often overlooked. So uh, when, when, at least when offering divine hiddenness. And so uh, did, is that a fair summary? That was beautiful. That was like better than the paper. That was amazing. Yes. Okay. That was great. I don't even know if I have anything to add. Actually, that was that was perfect. <laughs> All right. Well, then, yeah. with that with that said, that's the that's Liz's response to the argument from hiddenness. Um, I think that it's really unique. I haven't seen anybody take Pascal's wager and apply it like that. So, what I would love to do, if I can get my PhD, is take Pascal's wager and like I'll just apply it in different different circumstances. Different. I'm I'm super interested in the moral argument. And I think that there could uh -huh. be like some significant overlap between the moral argument and Pascal's wager that I've not seen people do yet. So I'd like to investigate oh, that more. Um, that is cool. That's so awesome. Yeah, we should talk more about that sometime. That's really interesting. Cool. Uh, yeah. So with that said, let's look at some questions. So we've had several. And um, let me back up. So I said that I would ask, uh, I told Zane who I've mentioned a few questions from. I told him earlier that I would uh, make sure I mentioned this. I'm uh, trying to find the 
part that I told him. Hmm. Zane, I'm sorry. I know that I told you uh, I would mention a question, and I can't find that question that you, you said. So I'm going to ask Curtis Fleming's question. So Curtis picked up on my door analogy. Uh, can mm-hmm. you see the can you see the the live chat? Yep, I'm okay. looking at it right now. So I'm looking at Curtis Flaming, the very first one he wrote. He said, "Which is more rational, to open the door with a 0.5 chance of infinite positive utility, or to choose any other door than the one you think has 0.5 chance of negative infinite utility?" So I guess he's saying if there's there's another door that you think has a 0.5 chance of infinite negative utility. Any Choose any oh. door but that. I think he's saying any door besides that one, uh, that would be the most rational thing. Pick that one. That would be the most rational thing to do. Um, it's an interesting thought. I don't know. What are, you th- what are you thinking? Yeah, I think, okay, so I think what he's saying is in one scenario, you pick the door that gives you a 50% chance of getting something infinitely good and then in another scenario you basically avoid the door Mm -hmm. that gives you a 50 percent chance of getting something infinitely bad Mm -hmm. yeah i mean and so it seems to me that even in that case what would be the most rational thing to do is if i'm going to pick another door besides this bad one i should pick one of the doors that has the greater chance of giving me something really good you know what I mean? Right, it doesn't make exactly, as much sense exactly. to... It makes sense to avoid the negative door. Yes. That makes sense. Avoid yep. that negative door. But if I'm going to have to pick something else, then pick the one that's that's most likely to give me the, the, the best chance of something really positive. Uh, it doesn't make as much sense to be like, avoid this door, but pick that crummy one. Uh, or the, the one that's more likely to be crummy. You know what I mean? It's not as bad as this one, but it, that doesn't make as much sense to me. Okay. Right, right, right. Uh, yeah, and I think um, in the case where you're avoiding the negative door, I guess part of it would depend on like what what probabilities and utilities apply to the other doors, you know. Um, so if you just like have no idea and they're all question marks, uh, you know, that would be one thing. But if you have some way to figure out or like uh, some way, you know, a way to kind of weigh them against each other, then you could kind of use that to justify. Uh, picking one over the other or if you think that they're all the same but they're all better than this negative door then you could just pick one at random i guess gotcha yep Yep. okay brian w who's right below curtis uh uh flaming flaming said anyone know what denomination jordan and liz are (laughs) (laughs) you go first if you want to answer you don't have to answer Um, no no i actually grew up mostly in kind of non-denominational churches and uh, I last went to, the, the last church I went to that was a denomination was sort of Presbyterian, sort of Reformed. Um, but right now I again go to a non-denominational church. So um, I guess non-denominational, some people think that's a denomination, but I don't really strongly associate with a particular denomination. Yeah, so. I'm probably in a similar <laughs> boat. I'll, I'll tell you, I go to an Assemblies of God church. Um, oh, cool. I, and I'm, I am charismatic. That's something that's important to me, uh, th- and and so I wanted to pick a, a church that um, a- is at least open to that. Now, not off, you know off the rocker on how it's practiced, but it's it's it does follow you know um, guidelines and things. Uh, I won't get too much into that, but yeah. I, I don't even. I'm not saying that. I subscribe to everything the Assemblies of God says. That's the church that I go to. Um, I agree with them on uh, at least the continuation of, of spiritual gifts, but I'm not uh, at all... I don't know that I'm on board with any denomination on every single thing that denomination says. Uh, so yeah. I just don't know. There's a lot I that I don't know. I agree with you on, on both those things. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't, I'm not a cessationist, but I also think there's not one denomination that captures everything. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um okay so then yeah the last couple questions here zane said this is his only question uh left for you um what do you oh. think is the strongest evidence that god exists Ooh, interesting yeah i mean i guess there's a 
few arguments for God's existence that I kind of like. Um, I guess strongest would be like, which one raises the probability the most? I mean, I think fine tuning is really interesting. I Mm -hmm. think that probably raises the probability quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Um, But I actually, I mean, I want to mention this because it's a little unique, even, even if I don't know if it raises the probability quite as much as fine tuning. But I think there's actually a really interesting argument um, well, one for the existence of abstract objects. So abstract objects are things like numbers, um, maybe like mathematical and logical truths. Some people think moral truths. Some people think properties. Um, but there's, but it's basically these objects that you can't really account for. At least a lot of people think you can't really account for by just appealing to concrete things in the world. Mm-hmm. But we need something kind of over and above those. But uh, so that's step one. But then step two is like, it's really weird if there's just some realm where like the number two is just kind of floating around. Like, mm-hmm. like what? Like, that's so bizarre. Um, so I think you can kind of combine these two things. And um, there's various proposals for how we might ground or understand abstract objects in terms of God or God's nature. So it would be kind of like an appeal to the best explanation sort of argument. Um, but I actually think, yeah, the existence, uh, sort of inferring the existence of God from these sort of two things. One, it seems like there's abstract objects. Two, it would be really weird if they were just kind of independent existence. Um, but if they were grounded in God, I think that would be a lot less weird. So I don't know if I would say that's like the strongest evidence, but I think that's sort of one argument that's a little bit unique that I think is actually some really kind of good evidence. Um, that that maybe philosophers aren't talking about as much but that and then i also maybe fine-tuning actually jordan i'm sure sort of curious if you would answer that question <laughs> <laughs> um well before i do <laughs> put you on the spot yeah before i do slam rn said oh kind of like idealism um i guess maybe she's thinking of just as like these things are going on in uh, they're almost con like a kind of conceptualism almost like uh these are concepts in god's mind she she says contingent on a mind is that how you're thinking of abstract objects like it's it's i don't know like there's different ways of grounding abstract objects in god you don't have to say that they just exist in his mind um but what i don't know is that what you were kind of thinking of yeah yeah maybe i mean i actually it, it is tricky to spell it exactly the way that they're grounded in god so maybe that would be a way an atheist could respond to this. I don't know. But um, but yeah, something like concepts that God has or something about the structure of God's mind. Um, yeah, I think there's various proposals that, that are interesting. And, and this isn't my main area of research either. So mm-hmm. I, I'm not really as much of an expert on kind of the, the specifics of the various proposals. But yeah, that was sort of generally what I was yeah. thinking. Okay. I think yeah. that there's an interesting argument to be made there. Uh, I, the one that I'm thinking of is uh, uh, propositions. So it seems mm-hmm. like yep. it seems like there are things that are necessarily true. Like we can't, I can't. There are some things that I can't imagine not being true. Yep. But the only things that are true are propositions, uh, and that would require a mind. And so it seems like there's a necessary mind, and that necessary mind would most likely be God if you t- do some of Josh Rasmussen's moves. Uh, mm-hmm. Like even, yeah. like I know just for example, uh, <laughs> this is off topic, but these are just some of the things I think about. Uh, the proposition, nothing exists. You know, like mm-hmm. we, we might think it's possible that there was, no- that there could be nothing at all, nothing. But then if there were nothing, it would be true that there were, that there were nothing. At least it seems to me. Uh, that there mm-hmm. it would be true that there is nothing, but if it's true that there is nothing, mm. there would need to be a mind that would think, you know, that would think that proposition. Yeah. And so I don't know if it's possible that there could be nothing. It seems like there would have to be at least one mind. Um, I don't know. I, these are just something yeah. that I think about. Um, I don't think that's necessarily the best argument for God, but that's just related to what you're saying. I don't know what I would say yeah. the best argument for God is. I guess in some ways I'm like planning a in that I don't know that any one argument is is all that spectacular. Uh, mm-hmm. I I definitely offer argument like there are arguments that I think are really strong. I don't think I've got any argument that would like compel belief, and I 
sometimes I feel like when people say, what's the best argument? They're almost wanting something like, what can you give me that would compel me to believe? And I don't know that I can give anything that would compel you to believe. Um, but there are really strong arguments, and you, people can disagree about that. Fine tuning's good. I, I made a video on that that you can watch uh, that's like a Bayes, Bayesian version. Uh, mm, cool. But yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm interested in the moral argument. I think that morality is uh, a very powerful thing uh, and, a, and something that can be difficult to uh, escape, I think. So yeah. anyway, um, yeah. all right. Well, yeah, I think I agree with Slam RN that I'm more of a cumulative case guy. Like if, if I went to a court of law and, and the, the defendant, or I'm sorry, the prosecutor was like, give me your best piece of evidence that would, uh, or, or yeah, yeah, if the, I'm probably getting it wrong. If uh, the defendant told the prosecutor, give me your best piece of evidence that would convict my guy, the prosecutor would be stupid to be like, here's the one piece of evidence. This is the one. It's like, instead he'd be right. like, here, I'll, d I'll give you a, a hundred reasons. I'll give you a hundred pieces of evidence. And, yeah. and that's way stronger. That's what I prefer. Yeah, no, I agree too. I agree too. <clears throat> And I know this is cheating and not answering the question, but in terms of like theistic arguments, my favorite is Pascal's wager. Maybe that goes without saying. But that, I, that's, maybe you would yeah. say that's not evidence for God. Right. That's yeah. what I was going to say. I, I don't care. Yeah. I, I do think that Pascal's wager has like all these wonderful benefits. Uh, and I'll just say like a couple that I'm thinking of off the, off the cuff. You might think I need some really strong reason to commit to God before I would actually commit. But Pascal's wager's like, no, no, no. You don't have to have some like incredibly strong thing. You just need this like, in your version, like it just has to be more probable than the others. Doesn't have to be like 50%. It's just more probable than yep. the others. Uh, so I like that. It really lowers the bar that natural theology needs to live up to and, and like Christian evidence needs to live up to. It's not like Christian evidence has to put it way up there at like 95% before you commit. It's just like, hey, we just need to beat the beat the other guys. That's it. Uh, yeah, we can all be right. low. We can all be really uh, – it's almost like, you know, on an elementary school basketball team, can I – can can I show up and and make a few more buckets or something? I don't have to be LeBron James. I don't know. That's how I think right, of it. Right. So I like it, that. it I like lowers that. it lowers that bar. But I also like Pascal's wager because it's the only. Well, I won't say the only one, but it's it's one that actually has you then do an action. Like it's not just the conclusion of my argument is God exists, and then it's like now what do I do? Ah, uh, well I don't. Do, what do I? You know, do I pray? Do what? Ah. Uh, Instead, it's like, no, 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 now you act on it. Um, so I really like nice. that it lowers the bar and it actually moves you to action. But I don't think that it's like evidence that God exists. exists. Yeah, right, 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 right. I mean, almost by definition. You know, right. So. Uh, okay, well, we can wrap it up there. Uh, if you'll stick around for just like one or two minutes, Liz, um, I'll say okay. goodbye. Maybe we can set up something else. But uh, thanks, everyone, for, for watching. Please check out my playlist on Pascal's Wager. Check out my interview with Liz. Uh, it was it went into a lot more depth, like looked at more objections. Also check out my interview with Blake Junta on Divine Hiddenness where he lays out some kind of greater goods um, and some other considerations that, that answer. I think everything he says, I think, can be strengthened by what Liz argues here. Uh, so mm -hmm. there's some things to check out. Thanks for watching. Um, see you Dakota, Brian, Slam Ariane, Zane. Thank you all for watching. Hope to see you again.